Thanks so much for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity of being here. Um, I'll try to be on time as well. Um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm Italian, so I talk a lot. Um, it's gonna be hard, but the clock started, so let, let me get started. So this is the flicker. Yes. So um, as it was mentioned, open source you know, has been um, a big journey for me. I was born and bred in open source. Um, I started uh, working in financial services in open source about five years ago. Honestly, when they called me and they said, hey, um, there's a bunch of big banks who want to do open source, I thought, you know, are you kidding me? And, um, you know, when I, even just four years ago, five years ago, and you'll see a slide with, uh, with that history, um, you know, when I started pitching, you know, open source to some of, you know, the largest banks in the world, um, you know, I thought they, you know, my line was, I'm, I'm not an open source hippie, uh, although I had dreadlocks when I was a kid, so that kind of, uh, you know, I had to hide pictures from, from, from internet. But, so, um, just quickly, I want, I want that minute, minute back, okay? <laughs> but uh, just starting from kind of introducing who we are, the FinTech Open Source Foundation. Uh, we have some of the largest banks behind us, and not only that, I think we have a really diverse community that puts together, again, our idea here is not to create a big boys club. Um, uh, we are a 501c6 nonprofit. If you're familiar with the Linux Foundation or OpenStack or several of the open source foundations out there, and our focus is really to solve problems specific to the financial services industry. So pretty, pretty pertinent here. Um, but what we tried to do since the beginning was not to just focus on sort of large investment banks or retail banks, but also to bring in several of the you know, up and coming fintechs, as well as you know, leaders in the open source space. You know, we have Red Hat, GitHub, GitLab, uh, several players that keep on, you know, obviously I'm here talking the WSO2 Summit. Uh, these are only just the members, but we have several additional you know, contributors outside our membership. This is an open source foundation, therefore there's no price tag attached to you know, you putting your sweat egg with your, your code in the foundation. Um, some of you might remember me, <laughs> or remember the foundation from, we used to be called the Symphony Software Foundation. Um, about two years ago, we expanded our remit. Uh, but the reason why I'm showing this slide is that, I mean, open sourcing financial services, you know, while still might sound like an oxymoron, um, it's not a new thing. Um, See, about six years ago, five, six years ago, Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs rallied up several other banks to create an alternative to the Bloomberg terminal as far as chat and communication goes, and they invested in this company called Symphony. Now, there was no way that, uh, let's say, Goldman had two contributions to create this software. There was no way that the other banks would, you know, work on Goldman code without this code being open source. And so that's why the Symphony Software Foundation was created at the time. And I think, again, this, was really important because it showed that even in financial services, the idea of using open source to not only collaborate across firms, but also commoditize a very highly sort of lock-in type of competitor, um, you know, was already sort of taking, taking place. And two years later, I think what we built was trust uh, across these firms, and so we went after a much broader opportunity. Um, the, the industry has been changing a lot, and hopefully today we'll talk about it as to why open source is now a real opportunity, whether you are an individual or representing your organization. Uh, but last year, about one and a half year ago, we launched Finos, the old FinTech Open Source Foundation, and since then we've seen a really, you know, uh, pretty amazing growth in terms of contributors, number of programs and software, open source projects and software, um, sort of open standards that we're developing in the foundation. So I want this to be a pitch of the foundation, although there's gonna be a couple of shameless plugs later on. But uh, I think if there are two things that I'd like to come across today is that A, uh, you know, as, as it was said, financial services is ready for open source. We are seeing a completely different context than it was even two, three years ago before we launched Finas. And then secondly, uh, this is a huge opportunity uh, I gave this presentation last week in San Francisco, I'm based there. Uh, obviously, that was more geared towards you know, VCs and, and commercial open source companies, but I think there is a huge opportunity, again, whether you are an individual or representing your organization in uh, open source and financial services. 
So I want to start with a quick parallel just to set the context. Um, I grew up in Italy. I moved to Holland when I was 23, 24. And that was 2006, 2007. Um, Italy at that time, still now, it wasn't really super famous for being technology uh, forward. But when I moved to Holland in 2007, I remember the Queen uh, promoting open source as sort of having to be the default solution to be picked in sort of public tenders. And you know, first of all, it was amazing to see a 70 years old uh, a woman talking about open source, again, coming from Italy. Um, but certainly that was speaking already about how quickly things were changing in government. And you know, if you fast forward 10 years later, which in you know, government time is, is pretty short time frame, um, you, know, you see uh, the launch of code.gov, you see the EU having a, a, a Europe-wide open source strategy. So again, just to say that you know, when I was growing up, open source and government, again, were completely uh, uh, sort of uh, separate concepts. And in just 10 years, we've seen a massive change. And this is just to set the context of what I hope, and that's our vision in the FinTech Open Source Foundation, we'll see happening in financial services. Now, um, there's few things pointing to uh, this direction. One, certainly the buzz is there. Um, and it's not just because Chris Skinner is saying that. I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he's a pretty uh, sort of famous influencer in, in the fintech space. Uh, but certainly the idea that the future of financial services can be open source is starting to gain sort of marketing and, and buzz. Um, I think Paul touched on this. I think certainly the technology landscape has been, you know, even over the last two or three years, wildly changing, wildly evolving. Uh, whilst there still are siloed stacks uh, in some of these largest banks, you know, with the up and coming fintechs, with, you know, decentralized technologies and, you know, truly, truly sort of disruptive uh, architectures, we are seeing much more something that is similar to banking as a platform. I mean, we have obviously still our court systems, uh, but through uh, more and more mature layer of APIs, this is going to sort of create a much more open platform and an open ecosystem. And I think this also relates to, especially in Europe, but, uh, you know, uh, regulations like uh, 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 GDPR, uh, 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 MIFID II, um, you know, really bringing back data in the hands of you know, users. Uh, I think KPIs are going to be f more and more fundamental to create uh, you know, an open ecosystem. And why I mention that is where I landed after a few years is that there is an increased realization that if your value, if you're building a platform, your value is not in the code. Your value is in the ecosystem and the channels that you're creating on top of that platform between value producers and value consumers. And so if that's the case, then it makes sense to open source your platform because again, that is not your secret sauce. And this is an realization that I'm seeing more and more and certainly I'm you know, pitching uh, within, within my community. Um, the buzz is there. The technology landscape is changing, but I think it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the most important thing and what I would like to walk you through today is that I'm seeing more and more the drivers being aligned for the different players that partake to this ecosystem. And again, whether you're an individual, whether you are a financial institution, uh, whether you are a regulator, uh, or whether you are a, uh, you know, fintech or tech open source company that, you know, obviously commercializes open source, uh, I think the drivers are increasingly aligned. And you know, in my role as an executive director of an open source foundation, I'm not the kingmaker. I'm not the king. Sorry, I can't really decide what uh, the community is going to be doing. Uh, I have to really lead by example. Uh, and really, my chief job is aligning drivers, is matchmaking. Uh, uh, really the needs of a certain part of the community with potentially the commercial drivers of another part of the community. And again, I'm seeing more and more, uh, you know, if the hypothesis is right, uh, that, that this ecosystem is ever more aligned towards open source. So let's start with individuals. Um, you know, communities are ultimately made of individuals, even though 
clearly our company is very you know corporate driven and you know we thank our corporate sponsors to allow us to you know pay the bills at the end of the month but ultimately communities are made of individuals and i think you know an, an area that is very close to my heart is is obviously developers i'm a developer well they don't allow me to touch code now for a few years but um i i do <laughs> Uh, have a history, I'm a computer engineer, and I think there is a liberatory aspect of what we're doing for financial services developers. Despite, you know, salaries are pretty high in this industry, and so extrinsic motivators are really, you know, stronger than I've seen maybe in other industries, I do believe developers desire to, uh, you know, the desire to fix problems beyond their four walls is still there, and so, you know, in some of these financial institutions, they cannot access GitHub. They cannot really, like it's, when I was a kid, I, you know, I was a consultant and I couldn't access Google in some of my customers. It's kind of the same feeling. And so we think that the movement that we're trying to drive is gonna have a liberatory aspect for developers. Um, and whether you're an open source developers, I mean, the flip side is you get access to, you know, pretty high paying job in this industry. And we wanna make sure that this becomes a, a more open uh, a sort of transfer of talent. Um, this is an industry with a high churn. Uh, every January, when my renewals come up, uh, several of my board members rotate from one company to another. And they end up going to the next company, typically having to fix someone else's mess. Um, because all these infrastructures are very siloed, and therefore, I think there is an advantage here. How good would it be if you can actually build on your previous achievements? Uh, again, when is non-differentiating? We are seeing, we've had several contributions now from Goldman, from Deutsche Bank, again, where we see then, you know, executives change <laughs> hat, and being able to reuse what is out there in open source. Uh, we've had several internal teams telling us, I'm not gonna build on my other team's platform until it's open source. Because otherwise I fear that it's gonna be defunded and, and next time I cannot deliver my application. So it's, it's been really interesting for us to see how open source plays on an individual level, not just at developers, but at sort of technology decision makers level. And finally, you know, we the people. I think this is a bit of a longer shot. But I do believe that if we're able to have this industry work with more transparency and more efficiency, there will be benefits for you know, the average job. And uh, uh, you know, not, in terms of not just in terms of customer experience, uh, you know, clearly some of the fintechs are already delivering to that, but I think also in terms of you know, actual transparency of the whole ecosystem in terms of how they operate. Um, Financial institutions, this is gonna be sort of the biggest chunk of uh, the presentation. Um, I think there are certain sort of, I think probably well known by now, contextual items that are driving uh, digital transformation and you know, strong innovation in the industry. Um, definitely the top line was, is not there, is not where it used to be prior to 2009. 2018 was the first year where uh, there was sort of sustained growth again, but we're talking nowhere nearly the type of growth that you see in like an AWS or sort of in, in some of the most valued uh, tech companies out there. Um, if you pair that with the bottom line and the fact that regulatory costs have sort of wildly increased, again, starting from 2008, 2009, you know, whether it's Again, I mentioned GDPR, MIFI 2, PSD 2, uh, Dodd-Frank. There's been several millions <laughs> and billions spent, actually, this is a quote from IHS Market, one of our, our, our gold members. Uh, it has been estimated that 2.1 billion have been spent across financial institutions for just for the implementation of MIFI 2. And this is one of the several regulations that uh, you know, have been mandated over the last few years. And so really the window has been shrinking and it's pushing these institutions to innovate not just you know in terms of agile methodologies we talked about it not just in terms of apis but all of the stacks that are largely siloed that have been historically largely siloed there has been a clear research for sorry clear 
uh, seek for uh, uh, neutralization, um, which has led to this sort of hate and love uh, relationship with the Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm based out west. Um, I don't want to kind of spend a couple of minutes on this. I mean, there's certainly an aspirational goal here of every bank is a technology company. And I think that's correct. They, you know, my board member JP Morgan has 16,000 developers under him. I mean, I have no idea what would I do with 16,000 developers. Um, on the other hand, there's the search for talent. Um, you know, it's hard to get top talent in a financial service institution. And I think this is you know, related to what I was saying before. It's not just extrinsic motivators. Clearly, salaries in this industry is, you know, are, are amazing. Um, but people want to have the freedom of being able to solve bigger problems, grow their own portfolio, which I think is a huge open source sort of differentiating feature. Um, and you know, last but not least, Amazon and, and the big tech is sort of eating uh, firm's business, you know, I, I hear often, often the complaint that, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that, and they're not a regulated entity. And I think more and more, uh, the tables should be turned. Like these organizations should use their regulated, regulated nature as a differentiator, as an advantage with respect to uh, what's happening out west. Now, I gotta say, there are certain things that, you know. Uh, 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 Wall Street and financial institutions have already caught up with uh, um, with, with uh, the Silicon Valley. I don't know if you're familiar with the Midtown Uniform uh, um, Instagram feed, but uh, you know, in terms of fashion, uh, clearly there is you know uh, uh, they have caught up. I mean, this is an amazing <laughs> uh, 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 feed where you know if you go, guys walk around Midtown, actually I don't see anyone with the uniform. I was gonna wear it myself, but uh, 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 vest and button-down shirt is something that, um, from my heritage, I'm not allowed to wear. So, um, moving forward, uh, on a more serious note, uh, I wanted to share just an example of how the perception has been changing. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, SecDB. It's, uh, it's the securities database that Goldman uses. This is an article from 2013. And it's been wildly, sort of widely recognized as their differentiator, as their uh, sort of what puts them ahead of the competition. And this is really what this article from 2013 is about. Now, if you fast forward four years, this is an article about SecDB, and it's an article about the language that is built on, which is called slang. It's an internal language that came from an acquisition in, in early 2000s. Now, it turns out that at that time, there was no Python, or Python was at the beginning of, of its history. Um, and while 20 years ago, building everything in Slang and doing things right, I mean, they have an amazing internal CI CD pipeline, model management, you know, it's old version and controlled, version controlled. Um, but now, other firms that are able to start on Python, on open source technologies, and gaining the benefits of things like TensorFlow, or Pandas, or other open source libraries are quickly, uh, uh, you know, picking up. And so is it, you know, the, what was seen as a huge strength even five years ago, just four, four, four years later, uh, has become a uh, potential weakness. And so, again, just a practical example of how these firms are looking at open source to really change the way they do technology. Now, truth is, um, it's, you know, the, the, the notion, the myth that uh, financial services doesn't do open source is, is way surpassed. I mean, this is data from last year uh, from our platinum member GitHub. Uh, been so kind to, to do the API calls and export this data for me. Um, this is uh, uh, data on GitHub activity from only financial services institutions, and we're talking about the largest ones. We didn't have a comprehensive list of the whole industry, but you know, it is pretty decent numbers. Of course, when you then normalize it with respect to how many developers they have, uh, it's maybe a little bit less uh, 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 sort of impactful, but again, they are doing open source, and you know, uh, 
I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We have a white paper coming out with an analyst soon. Again, shameless plug, as I promised. Um, but uh, you know, there's really different. Uh, uh, the, the spectrum is still really wide in terms of how the industry is approaching open source. We do have the innovators who are already using contribution as a strategic, uh, um, you know competitor commoditization business or mutualizing, reducing costs. But you go all the way up to those who tell you, no, we don't do open source. And that's the most scary thing that you can hear because truth is they are doing open source. The developers are consuming open source and if they're contributing, they're doing it you know, b behind the scenes. They are doing it without you know, following the rules. So it's much better to have a framework to allow them, even if in a quirky, controlled way, uh, 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 rather than assuming that you are not doing open source. So we touched about we touched on individuals, we touched on financial institutions. Um, my big theme for next year is going to go is going to be going after regulators. Um, we don't have yet a structured approach to regulators, so I'd be happy to. Uh, chat with any one of you uh, uh, in terms of getting suggestions and, and getting behind this, this vision. But I do think for several reasons, similar to what we mentioned already uh, for financial institutions, there is an inherent advantage for regulators to be behind open source, like we've seen in government in Europe. Uh, you know, open banking being a huge example, it's more focused around open APIs, but uh, uh, you can see that the world is going in that direction. And I mean, we talked about financial institutions having a hard time recruiting top talent. Well, this is infinitely harder for regulators because obviously they cannot offer the same packages of the same salaries as financial institutions. Um, and when I sort of put my geek hat on, uh, I do think that ultimately what regulators do is, you know, they have to go in every single institution and look both at the code and look both at how the code is deployed and put in production, who touched it, who is able to change uh, uh, parameters, who had access to it, audit the whole CI CD pipeline. And so I think there is an inherent advantage if, you know, different institutions would use the same at least core platform to implement regulatory constraints and then in the ideal world use you know a containerized immutable ci cd pipeline to bring this into production at that point all you all technical regulators should be doing is looking at the common code and looking at the common pipeline to bring this in production again this is probably overly simplistic and it's a vision you know maybe five to ten years from now but I do think it would you know, make the regulatory uh, um, framework much simpler for regulators and ultimately for banks to implement. And finally, we touched before on transparency. I think it's obvious that if I'm able to see the code that implements a certain regulation, that's sort of the ultimate level of transparency that you can get there. And so that's why we're, we're looking we're trying to find fancy names for uh, uh, how this can be called. And you know, everything as code is pretty cool nowadays. So uh, uh, open source regulation as code sounds sound something that we could rally behind, hopefully. Just to give you a couple of key examples, and I have only a few minutes left, so uh, I want to make sure uh, uh, I hit the mark. Um, we do have, we've been talking a lot about uh, uh, digital transformation. Um, Earlier this year, JP Morgan came to us. They were working one of the cloud providers, and they said, look, we do have a set of service, of what we call service accelerators. Um, it's basically certification of uh, uh, cloud providers against uh, uh, certain regulatory requirements. Think even just encryption at rest, encryption in motion, sort of the basic ones. Um, we think that all banks are doing the same, are going through the same journey. We think all banks have a multi-cloud type of approach or strategy. Can we work together? And so they contributed to the foundation what we call the cloud certification effort. We helped them rally up several other banks uh, to mutualize. I mean, the goal here is to have 
really at the end of the process, infrastructure as code on, say, Terraform or cloud formation, hopefully something that is across clouds, uh, that would provide you know, a way to stand up an infrastructure, that, an architecture that is already compliant with regulation, again, as code. And I think the two advantages here is not just mutualizing the work on you know, uh, uh, code, but it's also the work on inter interpreting the policies. Oftentimes, the policies comes in a pretty fluffy fashion. Like, it's not a spec. It's not something that you can quickly turn into a set of test cases. So there is advantage, again, not only mutualizing the technology costs, but also the legal costs, the, the interpretation of that policy in an actual spec that can be uh, used by, by all the firms. And so this is an activity that is already ongoing. We're going to uh, uh, formally launch it in November. But if you guys are interested, it's open. Uh, and we'd love, we'd love to have you know, support not just from the banks, but also from vendors that are, uh, you know, they obviously have a vested interest to, to participate in this. Um, and the second area is, this was supposed to be on one line, but uh, 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 KYC. Um, we, we have not started yet, but if you think about the cost of, again, uh, each firm going through KYC, uh, it's an ama amazing cost uh, uh, and is a poor user experience. We think there is, again, huge potential there. Finally, uh, uh, open source companies, fintech companies, uh, why this is an opportunity for them. Well, first of all, this is still a highly locked in uh, industry. There are massive proprietary players who, you know, really own in an almost monopolistic way certain use cases. And this has historically been a very fertile field for open source companies to come in and say, hey, I'll give you the same functionalities for a tenth of the cost. And you can take the code and walk away, obviously. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to get to the same feature fullness of, of certain of these vendors. But again, this is, we have seen this over and over again in different industries. And then um, the commercial open source index is nothing too fancy. Is a, is a Google Doc that is open source uh, on, on a fund called opensource.capital. Um, that tracks all the commercial open source companies above $100 million in ARR, in recurring revenue, there is zero fintech companies in there. So again, competition on one hand, a potentially fertile field. On the other hand, competition that is not that strong. Now, obviously, we have companies that make a lot of money in this industry. Uh, uh, so this is not entirely accurate. but. There are no specific fintech companies focused on just solving problems for the financial industry that have reached already the sort of uh, $100 million mark. So definitely a, a huge opportunity there as well. And with a little over a minute left, that's where we come in. Um, again, we are a nonprofit foundation. So we are open to everyone. Uh, uh, we welcome participation of any of those four categories, individuals, regulators, financial service institution, uh, uh, commercial open source companies, um, uh, through three main, uh, uh, you know, uh, we facilitate three main things. Um, sorry. First one being our programs. Um, not going to spend too much time on this. It's a bit of an eye chart. But these are all the different collaborative programs that we host in the foundation. As you can see, they're focused around either specific thematic areas or they're focused around solving a specific problem in the industry. Uh, one area that we do a lot of work is open source readiness. You know, as I've shown you before in the scale, the industry is, is across the spectrum. And so we want to make sure that we bring uh, you know, all these firms to be ready not only to consume and do it safely and securely, but also to contribute back. Um, and secondly, we realized pretty soon that the technology infrastructure for these firms to do open source wasn't up to par where, you know, other industries are. And so we provided a runtime for open source developers where we take care of, uh, you know, security, compliance, IP validation, IP cleanliness, and that in a way provides uh, contributors the peace of mind that we take care of the hard part, and you know 
consumers within financial institutions that the open source that is produced by Finos is financial services grade. Uh, we have several vendors here putting their technology uh, in there, obviously, because they want uh, uh, also visibility in the industry, and this, we hope, it will become a reference architecture for how these firms do open source. And so, with 42 seconds late, um, I want to just close. Uh, I hope this presentation gave you an idea as to why individuals, whether, again, you belong in any of these four categories, there is an opportunity for you to engage in open source contributions, in open source you know, commercial investment, in open source as a technical strategy, uh, really at the CIO level uh, within your financial institution. Um, and we certainly do hope you'll look at Finas for, for your uh, open source contribution within the industry. And you join us for our event on November 20th. Thank you so much.